of the few ways a young man could get out of abject poverty was through politics. The first great wave of immigration to America happened in 1845-1852. It was the Irish potato famine. Now, this forced many Irish men and women to immigrate to the United States. Now, if you were Irish, you landed in either New York or Boston. Now, most of the immigrants stayed in those cities. The first generation was treated horribly, as was the second. Signs were placed on the windows of local businesses. Irish need not apply. And another sign that was allegedly posted, Irishmen and dogs keep off the grass. These people took jobs in the factories, the mills, or as domestic servants. The hours were long, the work was hard, dirty, and dangerous a lot of times, and the pay was very low. But they had no choice. It was work or starve. Now, by the end of 1870, the cities were becoming overcrowded, disease-ridden. To get out of that life, many young men became involved in politics. Okay, political machines are characterized by a disciplined and hierarchical organization reaching down into the neighborhoods and block organizers. This enables the machine to respond to the problems of individual neighborhoods or even families. In exchange for the loyalty at the polls, the term refers to their ability to elect candidates or enact measures with mechanical efficiency and predictability. Now, many machines formed in cities to serve immigrants to the United States in the late 19th century. Now, these immigrants viewed the machines as a vehicle for political enfranchisement. Machine workers helped win elections by turning out large numbers of voters on election day. Okay, so how did this actually work? Well, you're representing the machine in your neighborhood or block. A family has no food because the father is out of work. You get the machine to supply food or maybe even get the father a job, but you tell them, just remember who helped you when you needed it, vote the straight party ticket come election day, meaning the Democrats. How does this get the young man and his family out of poverty in the slums? Well, that would be the patronage or spoils system. To the victory goes to spoils, right? In simple terms, political jobs are given to the people who work to get the party's candidate elected. This system went from the local street sweeper right up to the Oval Office. But wait for it. Even though the person worked hard to help get the candidate elected, any job he was offered came with a price tag. Money. You wanted a job as a police officer? No problem. Just pay the standard fee and you have the job. No money for the job? That's okay. The machine will deduct it from your pay. Now, of course, the price goes up as the pay grade of the job goes up. This was the patronage or spoil system. These loyal machine workers were expecting lucrative government appointments. Now, what would happen if a loyal voter voted against the machine? Well, that's simple. The voter would lose any and all help from the political machine. The author, Doris Kern Goodwin describes the process in her book, The Kennedys and the Fitzgerald. Now, I'm paraphrasing here. It's been years since I've read the book. Ballots are secret, but now and back then, nobody is supposed to know how a person votes. Paper ballots were used at this time. Political machines would make sure that hard lead pencils were used in the precincts. The machine also had a man at the ballot box cranking the ballots into it. Now, this guy made sure the folded ballots were placed in the slot in such a way that he could see that indentation from the pencil. If the mark was in the wrong place, he gave a signal. Before the voter left the voting area, he was informed he lost his government job. Now, another way to gain votes was to make sure your candidate was listed first on the ballot. Now, this was done by having a group of rather large men surrounding the candidate at the voting registrar's office, physically fending off any other rival candidate in his squad when the time came to register to go on the ballot. First come, first serve. Some of those brawls were legendary. Now, depending on the city, the machine might rule the whole city with one man at the top, or it might be divided up among a number of war bosses. Now, the Democratic machine in New York City was run by Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall was the headquarters of the Democratic Party in New York City. Now, boss William Tweed ran the New York City Democratic Party from 1859 to 1871. He was ruthless and corrupt. 
If you look up the definition of political corruption, you will find a picture of Boss Tweed. However, that could change in the near future. I'm just saying, you know. Okay, through bribery, kickbacks, non-competitive bids on city contracts, and just outright blackmail, Tweed amassed a fortune. It was through the efforts of Tom Nast that Tweed was taken down. Now, Thomas Nast was a German-born American caricaturist, editorial cartoonist, often considered to be the father of the American cartoon. Now, it was through Nast's political cartoons that he was able to shine a light on Tweed's defrauding of the American taxpayer. He portrayed Tweed as an overweight, greedy vulture. By 1871, the handwriting was on the wall. Tweed went to jail, but escaped and went to hiding. First in Cuba, then in Spain, until he was discovered through a cartoon of Nast and returned to the U.S. Tweed was tried, found guilty, and died in the Ludlow Street Jail, April 12, 1878, a broken and destitute man. So who were the supporters of the Democratic political machine? Well, the rank and file voter was made up of the working class, labor unions, and immigrants, while the supporters of the Republican Party candidates were the middle class, upper class, African Americans, and of course business leaders. However, political machines play both sides of the political aisle. You know, bribe here, a bribe there, political appointment over there, a corrupt senator's useless son-in-law being appointed postmaster of his hometown. Politicians' family members given no-show political jobs. Hence the term, gilded age, shiny on the outside, rotten on the inside. Who knows, we might, no, not going to go there. I could go on and on with stories of corrupt politicians, ballot box stuffing, political shenanigans, and skullduggery of the gilded age. But this is only a 10 minute video. However, a little teaser here. Landslide, Lyndon, and Box 13. President Lyndon Johnson, 1948, when he was running to become a state senator, basically, miraculously found a ballot box. He won that election by 87 votes. Hence the euphemistic term, Landslide, Lyndon. Well, anyways, I thought that might be a little interesting for you to hear. Okay, I hope this video helps you in your class. If you like the video and want to see more short 5-10 minute videos on U.S. history, click the like button. Ring the bell and please subscribe to my channel. But most importantly, leave a comment below. Thank you for watching.